All right, let's talk about energy. So energy is just going to be the capacity to perform work or move something against some force. So we've got potential energy, which could be, uh, to use kind of an analogy, this ball on top of a hill has a lot of potential energy. Same with a molecule with a lot of bonds. You could actually store potential energy within bonds, chemical bonds like gasoline, for example. And when you utilize this potential energy, and for example, you know, pushing this ball down a hill, what happens is that potential energy is converted into the energy of movement or kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is going to be working energy or energy in motion. And chemically, the way you would express kinetic energy is hydrolysis or breaking apart bonds, which would release stored energy or stored potential energy. So the two main types of energy we're going to talk about is potential energy, uh, which is chemically stored in bonds, and kinetic energy, which would be the energy of movement. Before we deep dive any more, let's talk about some laws of thermodynamics. These are going to be paraphrased. So the first law is that energy can't be created or destroyed. It can only change form. So we have potential energy, which can be converted into kinetic energy. You're not creating kinetic energy. You're not destroying potential energy. What you're doing is you're converting from potential energy to kinetic energy. The second law is that as energy is converted from one form to another, entropy increases, which is just uh, a way of, ex of expressing disorder. Entropy can kind of be roughly translated to disorder. So disorder increases, and some of that energy that you're converting from one form to another is actually converted into an unusable form, meaning that there's kind of a poor efficiency between conversions of one form of energy to another. So the unusable form usually is going to be in the form of heat. So we can't really use heat to do work for us. Um, so it's unusable. So while talking about energy, or ATP as we know is the energy currency of the cell, I have this analogy. Um, so let's say you're in India, and all you have are US dollars. So you, you, come, you go to India and you don't preemptively exchange your currency. You're in India and you want to buy something. Well, all you have are US dollars. Well, before you can buy that thing, the dress uh, in India, you need to get rupees, which is the currency that they use in India. So before you can buy that dress, what you need to do is you need to go to an exchange uh, or currency exchange. And at that currency exchange, what you'll do is you're going to hand them your US dollars and what they're going to do is, part of the charge for converting your US dollars into rupees, what they're going to do is they're going to take a little bit of a fee. So you have some, you're losing some of your currency to an unusable form, which are just those transaction fees. And then they give you rupees. And then with those rupees, now you can purchase that dress. You can purchase whatever you want. Because that's the currency that they use. Well, likewise, inside of the cell, the energy currency that we use is ATP. Now, if you eat a chicken tikka masala, for example, you're not going to be able to directly use all of that potential energy stored in those bonds. What you need to do is you actually have to metabolize, break down this food into their base components, and then break down those macromolecules into smaller pieces, releasing some potential, or le releasing some kinetic energy, releasing some potential energy, converting from, you need to intercellularly convert that potential energy into a usable form of energy, which is ATP. So through aerobic respiration, for example, um, you know, your mitochondria needs to break down the, you know, those, those intermediate byproducts of glycolysis, pyruvate, and it needs to break them down further uh, to create ATP. Well, in the process of all of those metabolic processes that that dish goes through, you actually lose some of that potential energy uh, to heat, an unusable form of energy. So you eat a dish, you're not going to be able to use it right away. You have to convert it to the currency within the cell, and you lose some to heat. So now let's look at um, the way, you know, we could, we could kind of use an analogy between cars and cells in a similar way. So cars, 
Uh, their engines use gasoline as a form of potential energy, so you combust gasoline. So all of the black orbs here are attached to other black orbs, and those black orbs are attached to the white orbs. The black orbs are um, carbon, and the white orbs are hydrogen. Usually in gasoline, or even if you're looking at triglyceride, a lot of the potential energy is actually stored in the carbon-carbon bonds. And so what happens is we will combust this gasoline, breaking apart those carbon-carbon bonds, releasing some of that energy. And that energy is converted into the energy of movement. That's what allows our car to move. So you have potential energy stored in these chemical bonds. We combust it, and we're left with carbon dioxide, which are individual carbons not bound to other carbons as well as water and through that process you lose some in the form of heat that's why your engine gets hot um, as it's creating that kinetic energy of movement or even just idling for example a lot of is lost a lot of that energy is lost as heat now the same thing happens in the cell we can take a triglyceride for example if, if you remember triglycerides have that glycerol backbone and then three uh, fatty acid tails or you could say hydrocarbons, which is just a collection of hydrogens and carbons. Carbons bound to one another and hydrogens kind of dangling off the side. And so you, what you do is you break apart these hydrocarbons into smaller pieces. You splice those into the uh, citric acid cycle if you're dealing with aerobic respiration through your mitochondria. And in the process of doing all of that and converting this potential energy within this triglyceride into ATP, you actually lose some to heat. And so that's going to contribute to your overall body temperature. So in a sense, what you're doing is you're combusting food and you're creating carbon dioxide and water. Now, instead of converting it directly into the energy of movement, you actually convert it into this intermediate potential energy, which then you will use to maybe move, for example. So you're going from potential energy to potential energy. And in the process, you're losing some to heat. So entropy, like I said, roughly translates into disorder. Uh, life generally requires constant input of energy to maintain order. So if we're talking about within a cell, you have all these compartments, or even if you're dealing with a prokaryotic cell, there's still organization within that cell. And it takes energy, ATP, the, currency of, the energy currency of the cell, to maintain that order. Typically, it's going to maintain that order at the expense of disorder on the outside of the cell. So to maintain life, essentially, is to spend energy to create order within something at the expense of disorder on the outside, at the expense of entropy on the outside of it. So all living cells need ATP to capture, transfer, and store energy, and to maintain order. And so here, this analogy is, you know, you have this, this nice bedroom, and it's pretty easy to go from the bedroom on the left to the bedroom on the right. Um, the bedroom on the right is pretty messy, happens spontaneously, it takes very little energy to go from this from the left on the left to the bedroom on the right. However, if you wanted to reverse that, uh, to go from this bedroom on the right to the bedroom on the left, it actually requires energy to generate order within the room. Okay, so let's look at ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. So tri meaning three, phosphate meaning you have three phosphate groups. Here's a phosphate here, there's a phosphate here, and there's a phosphate here. This right here, adenine plus that five carbon ribose, is adenosine. And then you have phosphate, 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 triphosphate. So this is the energy currency of cells, and you typically have high energy or low stability bonds that link the second and third phosphates. So here's the third phosphate, here's the second phosphate. Those high energy or low stability bonds are highlighted in red. Now this first bond here, this um, adenosine um, bound to a single phosphate, uh, has a very tight, stable bond here. So it's not, it's not likely that you're going to go uh, down further to just pure adenosine. Um, typically it's going to hang on to this monophosphate, the singular phosphate, and you'll get adenosine monophosphate uh, in dire conditions where you're really low on energy. But these two uh, bonds here are very unstable, meaning they have this tendency to spontaneously dissociate. Therefore, ATP is fairly short-lived. Typically within your cell, the only time you're really going to be making ATP is when you're needing it right away. 
you don't really make ATP and store a reservoir of ATP. You make it as you need it. All right, so adenosine triphosphate, it's composed of a ribose, a five carbon sugar, a nitrogenous base or adenine, for example, and then you have three phosphate groups. So adenine plus five carbon sugar plus phosphate, phosphate, phosphate. Now you can hydrolyze. So hydrolyze, if you remember hydrolysis, is to break something down, uh, typically using water as you know, the, the breaking component. Um, you can actually hydrolyze ATP into ADP. And you could also hydrolyze ADP into AMP, which is the lowest form of energy. So if you go from ATP to ADP, if you look here, hydrolysis, hydrolyze, uh, lysis means to cut, so you're using water to cut something. If you um, take ATP and you hydrolyze it, what you're doing is you're lysing off one of those phosphates, and in the process of doing that, you release energy. So you have ATP. Um, if you break it down to ADP, you're releasing a phosphate group and energy. Now to create ATP again, so let's say you have ADP and you want to recycle it to make ATP, well, it's going to take an energy input. So ADP plus energy... Uh, you grab an inorganic phosphate, which it fails to include here, but that's going to help you make ATP. All right, so ATP also has, has the, capa the capacity to phosphorylate things, meaning it just adds, you could, you could use it to add a phosphate to something. So you could use ATP to add phosphate groups to many different molecules, resulting in a reactive form of the molecule, or even maybe the inactive form of a molecule. It's going to change molecules by simply adding something to it. So the types of enzymes that are typically going to add phosphates are going to be an enzyme called kinases. We know this is an enzyme because it ends in an ace. So kinases are enzymes that catalyze the transfer of phosphate groups from something, a high energy phosphate donating molecule, to a specific substrate. So we have ATP here plus the substrate. It undergoes that enzymatic process where the kinase will add the phosphate from ATP to that substrate, and what you're left with is ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and then that substrate, the substrate bound to a phosphate group, which may change the conformation. So we have a practice question here. So which of the following statements about ATP is true? A, it contains five phosphate groups. B, uh, extremely stable bonds link the second and third phosphate groups. It contains the sugar glucose. And D, it releases energy when one phosphate group leaves ATP. So let's look at A. A, it contains five phosphate groups. Adenosine triphosphate, through its name, we know it has three phosphates, three phosphate groups. So A is, A is false. It contains three phosphate groups, not five. And we're looking for what's true here. That's untrue. B, uh, extremely stable bonds link the second and third phosphate. They're actually very unstable bonds. Uh, that link the second and third groups. Very high energy, unstable bonds that link the sec uh, second and third groups. Uh, the first group is the only group that's going to have a stable bond. So the one, the the uh, bond linking ad adenosine to the individual, the first phosphate group. Uh, C, it contains the sugar glucose. Yeah, it contains the sugar glucose. It actually uh, uses the sugar ribose, which is a five carbon sugar. Glucose is a six carbon sugar. And then D, it releases energy when one phosphate group leaves ATP. That is true.